Okay, my camera sucks, my backdrop is no good, but these are things I'm going to be working on. Let's get started. Hello everyone, welcome to Doug Talks Weird. My name is Doug, and today we're going to be talking about Laird Barron's short story for buses and the reader-protagonist relationship, and how the fanning protagonist fits into this concept. This is a good story, uh, for buses, to talk about such an issue, because while it does not consciously make a statement about the relationship, it does bring up some very important questions, such as how much does the reader have to understand the threat against the protagonist in order to be terrified by the threat. Um, <clears throat> today I'll be talking about the story right up to the very end, so let's go ahead and give this episode a spoiler rank of two. It probably deserves a three, but I argue this is the kind of story that you need to read two or three times anyhow just to truly get into, to truly absorb. And so therefore, knowing the ending isn't really going to be the, the end of the world when it comes to reading the story. It frees you up to think about it some more. Okay, some background on the story. It was originally published in February 2005 in the magazine of fantasy and science fiction, and it went on to be nominated for that year's International Horror Guild's Best Intermediate Form Award. It was anthologized a couple of times before getting into its current home, Laird Baron, the Imago sequence. Um, it is a story of Ray, a washed-up actor, exactly the sort you would picture on some sort of VH1 reality TV series called something like Coming Up Ray. He did some movies, he had a few canceled TV shows, and now he's been working on commercials. Ray is joined up with bounty hunters Cruz and Hart, heads up to Canada's search for a convicted rapist and kidnapper. He's fled up there with a victim accomplice, uh, victim slash accomplice. Uh, the bus doesn't go very well, some gunfires evolve, authorities get involved, and now Ray, Cruz, and Hart are drifting back homeward, which is where most of the story's creepiness comes in, because Ray is the type of character who gets into weird conversations that have exchanges with women he doesn't know, and they go something like this. Right through your meninges, sort of like a siphon. What? I said, I being Ray, I guess is a delicacy. They say it don't hurt much, but I say not to that. A delicacy? She made a face. I'm going to the garden. Want a beer? And this isn't the only such weirdness that Ray gets involved with on this trip back. Electronic devices keep going off on him. His cell phones will just cut off conversations, wash out in a wall of static and insect animal noises. Uh, he has a camera where he filmed footage of the bust of the, uh, the rapist, but now that the accomplice slash victim who was over on the side is now talking to him, and each time he watches it, it's something different. And so this is all culminating in a visit to the Mima Mounds, which may be the Mima Mounds. I should have looked that up beforehand. These natural mounds in Washington State that are anywhere from kind of small to a couple of meters high and several meters wide, and these gentle sloping natural structures that there's several theories about where they come from, but no one's exactly sure, um, which is something referenced in the story. Cruz and Hart, they go to get drunk, and Ray is left alone and has a mind-bending experience where he starts piercing through the veil. I had an epiphany. I realized the shabby buildings were cardboard and the people milling here and there at opportune junctures were macaroni and glue. Dull blue construction paper sky and cotton ball clouds. And I wasn't really who I thought of myself as. I was an ant left over from a picnic raid, awaiting some petulant child god to put his boot down on my pathetic diorama existence. Um, and shortly after that, the sinister shape of the world contracted around me, gleam like the curves of a great killing jar. I heard the lid screwing tight and the endless ultraviolet collisions, the white drone of insects. I turned right and walked up the hill. Fast forward to the mountains. Ray has gone off on his own. He said, checked up there. Cruz and Hart are following him. And now Ray is starting to feel definitely hunting. All these weird little quotes and conversations he's been having, the repetition of Insect imagery, insect feeding imagery. He gets a phone call from Hart, which again degrades to static clicks and insect sounds. And then the car with the bounty hunters drives off into the mounds and doesn't come back out. And all the tourists are drifting away because the, the park is closing down and Ray decides to go investigate. He doesn't see the true horror of what's waiting for him in the mounds. I received the impression of movement around my hunkered self, although I didn't hear footsteps. I shoved and pressed my face deeper into musty soil. Ants investigated my pants cuff. Um, note again, ants, insects. Cruz called my name from the throat of a distant tunnel. I knew it wasn't him, and I kept silent. Hart tried to coax me out, but this imitation was even worse. They went down the entire list, and despite 
everything. I was tempted to answer when my daughter began crying and hiccuping and begging me to help her daddy please in a baby girl voice she hadn't owned for several years. I stuffed my fist in my mouth, held on while the chorus drifted here and there and eventually receded into the buzz and churr of field life. Dusk was blooming when I crept from the bushes and tasted the air, caught in the ear for predators. The Chevy was there, shimmering in the twilight, motionless now. So, Probustus has another section after this, um, after Ray escapes the, the park. And it's either going to be kind of a fading out or a sharpening of the heart, depending on the reader's take of it. I'm not going to go into that. I'll let you read the final lines. Um, this covers the major bits. Uh, Baron's playing around with the, the gothic tradition of sights and sounds as a repeated form of omen, um, a sense of doom, the beating drum, where the rhythm is, the, the elements that are, you know, in this story they're made of a insect clicks and animal sounds and odd conversations with people who seem to know more than they should. Uh, the the mime amounts, the smell of chlorine bleach shows up in a few places, pale faces, failures of technology. These are all breadcrumbs letting the reader know that Ray is on a path of doom. Just, you know, there are certain things that you're never given a definite answer to in the story. It's Ray's phone really transmitting these insect sounds, so is whatever stalking him actually messing with the electronics around him? Is the TV actually predicting the future? Is uh, the footage he recorded of the the bust that went wrong, is it actually changing on the videotape to have these weird conversations with him? The form and the something in the mound is mostly told by what it is not. You know, it is not Cruz, it is not Hart. It's not his daughter. It's not all these other people that tried to be to trick him. By extension, you could say it's not human. But you can't really go much beyond that. Um, or is this like a reference to the ants, to get the parasite that causes them to crawl up on the grass and be fed upon? There's several re degrees. There are several degrees to which a reader can connect to a protagonist. At the most basic level, there's apathy. Uh, the reader has no real care for the character, or characters specifically, and they're mainly reading the story for plot, maybe prose, maybe some of the concepts, maybe because they were told to in class. So then you get the next level, and this is a, this is a huge jump from apathy to here, and it's sympathy. With sympathy, you can start to appreciate what a character is going through. You don't necessarily understand their actions, but you can have an emotional appreciation for what the character is putting up with. And then sympathy's next level is empathy, where you start actually understanding what the character is going through. It's maybe not as big of a jump as from apathy to sympathy, but it's still an important jump. And then the fourth level is what you would call identification where you go beyond just understanding the character, or you go beyond just appreciating the character, but you start to actually feel that you and the character are one and the same, and you stop becoming, an, or you stop being an observer so much of the story as someone who actually feels invested. Um, emotionally, yes, sometimes even morally or mentally invested in the story, but identification is so strong in 2014, study actually showed that people with medical conditions, given stories with characters of the same medical conditions, and were allowed to identify with those characters, made better choices in the real life because of this identification, because of this relationship they had with the protagonist. And this is why the feigning trope can be problematic. Um, sometimes this is a literal feigning, often with the protagonist waking up safe if not sane in the comfort of her own home, um, or in a hospital. Uh, sometimes it's fleeing insensibly from the scene, usually in the last couple of sentences of the story. Uh, sometimes it's going mad, uh, maybe with literal feigning, or just going mad on the spot and someone involved in that. So Lovecraft, uh, the big iconic Lovecraft, is mocked for this, but this is fair. Uh, is, for one, you know, the tradition of the feigning protagonist is rife throughout Gothic and Victorian tradition. I, I mean, what percentage of the stories actually have it? Well, by my rough count, you have this many, which, phew, a lot, right? 
And as you see, not all of these are little things. Some of these are my kind of extended definition of thing. But I want you to note that in some of them, the feigning is less an easy way to end the story, less a convenient way to stop the uh, protagonist from having to explain how he, and with Lovecraft, almost always a he, escaped some ultimate doom. And in some cases, the feigning is made into something that's useful to the story. Uh, in The Strange High House in the Mist, it nails the dreamlike quality Rats in the walls, the fainting madness of the character who then wakes up eating his friend. It brings the reader along in a powerful little breakdown of consciousness. So it can be made to work, even in a guy who is well known for being cliche with the fainting protagonist. So Let's talk briefly, then, about what happens when it does and doesn't work. Think back to what I was just talking about with the relationship between the reader and the protagonist. Very powerful stuff. And so in order for horror or weirdness to click on an emotional level with the reader, um, and not just a, oh, God, that's kind of creepy, or, oh, God, isn't that weird level, the reader has to invest some in the protagonist. It doesn't take a whole lot, because horror and weird fiction are genres that play a lot of times with the gut emotion. Uh, but it works best when there is at least sympathy or empathy. So in this mindset, if the reader's going along, um, clicking, emotionally sympathizing, emotionally empathizing with the character, the feigning scene can trigger one of two responses. If done well, it triggers the same sense of confusion and loss to the reader that the protagonist is receiving. The, the reader doesn't literally faint, but that closing off of the narrative by having it closed off to the protagonist engages in something like a, a, a narrative fainting. Um, it allows the reader to live through this horrible situation vicariously. Um, by splitting the narrative like that, the reader is kind of forced to fill in the blanks. And if the reader has been properly emotionally engaged with when they fill in the blanks, they're going to fill in the blanks with something more horrible than the writer probably could have possibly filled in. On the other hand, it can completely rob the reader from a connection to the climax of the story. The, the, the reader could have been completely into it, completely ready to face down the monster and be scared, and then suddenly it's snatched back. And if the reader isn't emotionally engaged and ready to fill in the blanks, or isn't primed to fill in the blanks, um, maybe you could say correctly, then suddenly the reader is left out high and dry. It could be a powerful tool, confusion and blindness and the unknowable, or it can be a fairly milquetoast solution to a complex problem, um, like a Gordian knot that's not so much solved by chopping it, by, but solved by just tossing it in the drawer and forgetting about it. And this is why Probesis, for me, is such a good story for talking about this, because while it never really gives us answers, and while Ray's dark epiphany is something a little bit outside of the everyday human thought, um, and while you know Ray doesn't face the thing that comes out of the mound but still cowers in the ground, so we're only given this ephemeral impressions of it almost entirely with sound, it forms a relationship between us and Ray. It helps us to not just read what Ray is facing, but to read the the darkness of the barren universe, B-A-R-R-O-N, in a very vivid, living way. But this only happens once you give yourself time to chew on it, and you get get in the mindset of sort of chewing on the weirdness of the conversations and the, the repetition of the sense data. Uh, you take yourself, you, you take yourself, give yourself time to be part of the character, and the you know, the unknown aspects of the story is gnaw back at you. Okay, so that's just something to think about. Uh, in my introductory episode zero, I said I was going to also talk about how the story was Aikman-esque, but I'm actually going to save that for uh, my next episode, episode two, in which I'm going to talk about one of the most Aikman-esque stories around, uh, Robert Aikman's own The Trains.